Bandwidth for ChangeLog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com and we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. I'm Aaron Natu and it is go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Go Time. We had a little bit of a long break there, two weeks, uh, but we are back. On the show today, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. Uh, Brian Kettleson is also here. Hello. And Carly Pinta. Hi there. And our special guest for today actually gets to blend two worlds for us, uh, both Go and information security. Uh, please welcome to the show, Aaron Natu. Hey, everyone. So uh, for anybody who may not be familiar with you, do you want to just kind of give like a brief background, maybe how you got into security and, and how you transitioned into Go and a little bit of how that fits into your current role? Sure. Uh, so starting out in security, uh, I never I never really got into the industry early on. It was, it was a little bit later when I was in university. Um, I originally went to school for uh, criminology and I was on the path to, uh, to becoming a federal police officer. Um, but when I was at school, uh, I ended up meeting a guy who who was into hacking and he was actually pretty good at what he did. And he was showing me some of the stuff he was doing. And I, I remember one day he pulled open his laptop and he was running Linux on it, um, probably some Ubuntu derivative. And, uh, and then he was, I think he was a hack in the Wi-Fi. and he showed me this. And I'm like, my mind just, it blew my mind. And I, I said, you can do that with a computer. <laughs> and then from then on, I basically spent all my time just researching into how we did that and, and how this stuff works. And, and I was spending, you know, all my time doing that. So I figured, um, why not just switch into doing that permanently instead of going uh, going down the path I was going? And then I ended up switching into uh, into computer security um, as the end goal. So to get there, I think I, I knew that I had to do uh, a lot of other things, uh, cover a lot of bases to get to the point where you're doing security. Um, so I, I ended up going back to school for uh, essentially system administration and networking. Um, and then I did another program for uh, computer programming, uh, worked at a firewall company and just kind of found my way through different roles like system administrator, uh, network engineer, uh, developer, um, with the ultimate goal of always getting into security and, and finally found my way into, uh, I ended up starting my own security consulting company after, after a couple of years of doing those other jobs. And, um, that went really well. It was uh, more of a red team side of things. We can talk about what red team means later on, but I'm um, working with smaller companies. And then I, uh, ended up getting approached by the company that I work for now, um, and, uh, I had the opportunity with them to, to do security consulting as well. And the, the big draw for me was that the people that I, that worked there were all really, really smart and they knew, they knew a lot about security. Um, so I knew I could learn a lot from them. And not only that is they had a, a more international, um, clientele. So I wanted the opportunity to work with big clients, uh, to travel around the world and really see how security work at a bigger scale. Uh, than, than what I was working on before. So yeah, I, I got into into consulting that way and then um, eventually found my way uh, after doing that for, for a few years, um, really enjoyed it. But I found that I, I was getting to the point where I needed to get more coverage than, than depth. Um, and so I was, you know, doing a lot of the same stuff over and over again. And, and it was interesting, but I, I needed, I wanted more. Um, so I wanted to to be able to dive a little deeper. So now the the job that I'm in is uh, I'm a security researcher uh, at Security Compass, and the role basically involves me diving deep into security, into technologies, and and finding ways to to break them to better secure them. And then uh, from there, going around and sharing what I learn um, at conferences, uh, at local user groups, and and just sharing what I have. And and part of that background that I didn't really mention that ties into this is I was also a uh, college professor in application security for some time. So, um, fun fact about that was I, I chose to use Go as the program language for that, and and a lot of the students really really enjoyed it, and it was it was an interesting experience. I can I can get into that more later too, but uh, yeah, that's kind of how I found my way to this this point. Um, as far as Go, uh, what got me interested in Go was I, I have a friend who uh, his name's Thomas Shadwell. He's uh, he's a senior security um, engineer over at Twitch, and and I think. 
everyone knows Twitch is a pretty big proponent of Go. So he uses it every day in his job and he loved using it. He's really, really good at it. He's a super smart dude. Um, and he just, he showed me what he was doing with it and, and kind of helped guide me through some of the basics. And then from there, I just latched on and I, I really, really enjoyed using it. So started building some open source tools, um, contributing to projects. Uh, and just, I actually started using it as, as the scripting language almost for, for my, my pen testing work. Um, Python is kind of the most common one now, but I started using Go on, on a regular basis and just picked it up and started using it more and more. And, and to this day, I, I really, really enjoy working with it um, for a number of reasons, but that's kind of the long winded answer to, to where I, how I got to where I am today. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. So I want to pick up on one thread. You mentioned that you were using Go to teach here. Mm -hmm. And so two related questions. Um, how did it go to uh, teaching Go? Um, did you students find it easier? Did they complain? Did they have uh, praises for it? How did that go? And how do you think Go compares uh, with Python for security related things? So um, to answer the first question, as far as how it went teaching it, um, Teaching it was good. It, I think it. Uh, I was teaching developers, so they were they're a group of third year uh, programmers, and so they had some of the basics. I think they had done a lot of work in Python before, um, Java as well. So they had some of the basics uh, fundamentals down. Um, it was just a matter of I think teaching them. The, the approach that I took was forcing them to learn a lot on their own because as as we know, like when you're in software development and infosec especially, is you have to you have to teach yourself a lot. Um, so now that they knew the basics, what I did was I, I pointed them towards a few resources like the Go Tour, which was fantastic. Um, giving them uh, a few books on Go. I think the one that I used in the course um, was the Go Programming Language by Donovan Kerningham. Um, but there's now, I mean, I think both Brian and uh, Eric are, are have both put out a book as well. There's so many out there that there's a ton of resources. So I pointed them to the right resources and then guided them through using it in real applications. And I think that was the the real um, key point was was giving them projects where they had to actually build things and go, starting out easy, um, but being able to tie that into really useful, interesting things like building uh, a fuzzer in Go or or writing a deliberately vulnerable web application where it was vulnerable to something like SQL injection. Um, gave them something interesting to work on. And, and this is how I've, I've always approached learning a language was finding a project to, to build on. And I think by doing that with them, uh, it made it a little bit easier for them. It wasn't, uh, I wouldn't say it was like super easy for them to pick up, but having those resources and then being able to answer questions to them was um, was really, really valuable for that. I can't remember what was the, the second question was, oh yes, it was how uh, how it compares to using something like Python for, for InfoSec. Mm -hmm. I think um, I'd like to hear that kind of from like a, a more like generic perspective, because a lot of InfoSec people use Python. And I think a lot of that is, you know, they can do things like HTTP servers and things like that significantly easier. And I think the, the standard library that Go provides makes a lot of that easier. So I'm really interested in both like in that learning example and just in the broader area of developing security tools because most of it is developing one-off things right like mm -hmm. a lot of people build scripts and stuff they reuse but a lot of times it's just one-off things and I'm, I'm really curious myself too uh to follow up on that kind of how you feel about using it to write those tools in place of python so there's no uh there's no doubt that python right now is probably um is in most cases it's the the easier choice and the better choice because there is a ton of libraries out there right now that support Python um, for security. But the thing is, Go is getting to the place where there's more support for that. Um, a lot of the work that I've done to this point has been mostly with the standard library, and it's entirely possible. It's one of the things I love about Go is it's possible to write full applications and, and even scripts just using the standard library. Um, but as more and more libraries come online and, and packages become available and more people start contributing to Go and, and from the security world, it's going to get a lot more use and it's going to be a lot easier. Um, right now it is, I would say it is more difficult for most things uh, because you have to really do it almost from scratch. You have to do it from a much uh, lower level, but it's not impossible. And I think once you get the basics down, once you start to learn um, what's available to you in the standard library, then it becomes easier. So you're saying that part of the difficulty 
is is having to write things from scratch, but it's more difficult because uh, people are not aware of the functionality in the standard library, because it, it's such a a common thing for Go developers to want to build things from scratch, and they they find that it's uh, there are a lot of benefits from that. Yeah, if you're coming from a developer standpoint, um, I would say it's it's a lot more fun to do that. Uh, it's you get to understand the language a lot more, and that's. Um, one of the things that I've benefited from in, in writing Go is I've gotten to understand uh, how it works at a much lower level because I'm diving into the um, the source code of the actual standard library more than I would have done in any other language. So I'm learning a lot more about Go in the process. But I think the problem comes in where um, a lot of people that are in security are not necessarily developers or don't have a developer background. Uh, a whole separate point is is why developers would make good security engineers and, and good um, pen testers. But I can cover that later. Uh, but the reason the reason why I think it's harder is because a lot of, like I said, a lot of the people in InfoSec don't necessarily come from a software development background. Um, so I, for me, I, I do. And so I enjoy doing that. And I think that's one of the things that's made it easier for me. Um, but I think a lot of people, they want, Eric's right, there's a lot of one-off scripts. And if you can do something quickly using another library, then it makes it a lot easier. Um, and that's that's something that I think we can contribute more to. And what I'm trying to do is, is help build more of those things. Um, but there's, there's only one of me <laughs> and, uh, there's a lot, a lot that needs to be done. So what I would say that if you want to contribute to InfoSec from the go side of things is start looking at what Python libraries are available. Um, like there's, uh, there's one beautiful soup was one that was made in Python. It was pretty big for scraping web content. I, I know that recently there was a, an open source version of that in go, um, that I looked at. There's a major package called, I think, called Scapy that does low-level uh, packet manipulation in uh, in Python. And there may be something out there, but I haven't found it that does similar things. But if you can build something like that in Go to do easy low-level packet manipulation, then that would be that's probably one of the most heavily used um, libraries in uh, in InfoSec when we're talking about developing. So I, I mean, to answer your question, it's it's hard because of the lack of libraries because not a lot of people come from a development background. But if you do come from a development background, it's it's awesome, and you learn a lot doing it, and you just get better over time. It's with any, it's the same with anything. That makes sort of sense. So speaking of the uh, background thing, uh, one of the things that stands out when you were talking about how you got into this is just the breadth of your background. Do you feel like there's um, room for somebody to just come in and start learning about infosec and security, or do you feel like uh, having that really broad? operations and security and programming background is required or just helpful? So there's no doubt that it's helpful. Um, the way I look at it, and if anyone, I've been, I ask, get asked all the time, how do you learn to hack? Really, it's, it's kind of the most common question that I get. And the answer I always give is, is hacking is, um, hacking is really understanding a technology or understanding how something works so well that you can find ways to abuse it or ways around it that other people haven't thought of. So you don't need a deep operations background to do that. You don't need um, to have done a lot of development to do that. You just need to start somewhere that you really want to understand more and dive into that and then start looking at it. The most fun part is looking at applications like you're an attacker. So look at an application or a technology and say, if, if I was going to attack this, what would I do? And the three things you want to really look at is, is uh, there's, it's called the CIA triad. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So if you can look at breaking one of those three things in an application, if you understand it well enough, you'll probably find a way to break it, uh, regardless of your background. It's just a matter of diving deep into something to understand it well enough that you can find a way around it. Yeah, and I think sometimes it comes down to, um, you know, you fuzz things a little bit and then understanding why it broke. Right. Like if you can reproduce it breaking, then you can usually exploit that. But it's you have to understand why it broke so that you can use that to your benefit. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really for people who love deep diving into stuff and, and why does this work and, and things like that. It's a lot of fun, though. Yeah. And that's why I think developers love it. Or, or developers could be really good at it because I think every developer I know who's really, really into it, you you have to keep learning. You have to dive deep into a technology all the time. And that's really the same basis for InfoSec. Yeah, I think um, it's it takes a creative mind too. 
like to try to when you understand all the pieces and how they fit. And it's uh, almost like solving like an engineering uh, problem or troubleshooting mm -hmm. uh, some issue is if you understand how it's supposed to work, you can figure out the points of attack and kind of how you can sneak around using it the way it's supposed to. And for anybody who like wants to just try their hand at it, there's a bunch of sites for that stuff. Uh, vulnhub.com has vulnerable virtual machines mm -hmm. that you can attack. And if you need a little help, um, there's usually walkthroughs for those. Um, what am I thinking? I think over the wire has some from like an, uh, Linux systems perspective where you try to attack permissions issues and, and things like that. Uh, I'm trying to think if you want to get into reverse engineering, there's a few sites for like crack me's and stuff too. Yeah. But, uh, I think everybody should try their hand at it just to kind of understand, uh, the perspective an attacker comes from. Yeah. And you're totally right when you say it's just like an engineering problem or an engineering challenge. It's, it's. The way I look at it a lot of the time is it's a game. It's a, it's a really fun, deep technical puzzle that you have to solve. Um, and there's a ton of resources out there to practice it. That's really how I started learning was um, back in the, way back in the day, people started learning by being <laughs> essentially doing criminal, <laughs> criminal activities where you're hacking into things you're not supposed to be hacking into. But you don't have to do that anymore. And, and the way I learned was I basically set up a, a, a virtual lab using VMware or VirtualBox. And I would have three VMs going at once. Um, I would run you know, an old version of Ubuntu. I'd run uh, maybe an old version of XP. Uh, and then uh, there's also a few other virtual um, machines that you can use. There's one called Metasploitable. There's one called Mutilidae, I think, like M-U-T-I-L-L-I-D-A-E, I think is how it's spelled. Um, there's a couple other ones out there, but uh, there's, there's a ton of different deliberately vulnerable VMs that you can go and attack. And that's what I did. And you learn how to do it through doing it. Um, and if you don't, if you want more of a collaborative environment, um, there's uh, essentially games called Capture the Flags. Uh, and, and I can get into that more, but it's essentially a, uh, a hacking game or a hacking competition. And they're held all over the world. You can access them online. There's a website called ctftime.org. Uh, and it's essentially a location where you can find where all sorts of uh, active capture the flag games are happening. You can sign up for them. And that was another way that I, I learned uh, a lot about security is, is through those, those um, competitions. It just, those competitions are good because they teach you how to think like an attacker. They don't necessarily teach you uh, as many real, some of them teach you the real uh, applicable attacks you can use, but a lot of them are about really tough challenges that force you to think the way an attacker would have to think. So there's all different ways and there's uh, to, to actually learn on your own through those kind of vulnerable services as well. I think it's interesting, though, too, because uh, there's a lot of similar aspects when you think about like learning engineering, like where you go down these avenues and maybe it doesn't get you to what you're trying to, to build, but you learn a lot in the process. And I think mm -hmm. that information security the same way, like when you're when you're trying to attack something, um, being able to identify that you're chasing a red herring, you know, like it's easy to lose a ton of time. <laughs> because something looks like that's the way and it's actually much easier. So being able to kind of like step back and take a, a fresh look and yeah, so much fun. Yeah. So I kind of have a question too, because you, you border these two worlds, right? Like you, you've got mm -hmm. uh, information security background and a development background. And uh, I'm really interested on your perspective uh, about how those two worlds meet. Because from my, my standpoint, the way I see it is, there's a lot of information security people talking to information security people, and there's a lot of programmers talking to other programmers. And I, I don't think there's a lot of like cross pollination between those two worlds. So, and, and it's constantly, you know, the other side feeling like the other side is evil and, you know, <laughs> they're, they're the enemy and you've got, uh, you know, like in the security world, like they were their, their programming uh, abilities like a badge of honor like the first thing almost yeah. every security person says when they get up on stage is i know my code's crap but yep yeah so bridging the two worlds i mean do you have another two hours to talk about this it's uh <laughs> it, it's an issue that i think a lot of us a lot of us have seen um and i'm fortunate in that i have that background to be able to to speak to developers and not be intimidated um i think part of it may be an intimidation thing um because both both fields are really deeply technical and really specialized. Um, but I think, so 
stepping back, part of my role and part of what I do is I go to conferences and I speak about security. But a lot of the conferences that I go to are security conferences, and I'm not alone in doing this. So a lot of us are going to the echo chamber that is the security world and saying, hey, these things are broken, we need to fix it. But a lot of not a lot of people are going to other platforms. So speaking to developers or speaking to, you know, going to a, a Linux conference or something or going to another conference where you have people that aren't necessarily in security and teaching them about security, I think is something that is, is lacking. And I think that it... it if we were to do more of that, like, for example, coming on here and being able to speak to a whole bunch of developers about security is a really is an honor. And it's really, I think, a really good opportunity to um, to educate people about this, because the people that are implementing security aren't necessarily the security people. People are implementing security are people in operations and development mostly. So those are the people that need to know a lot more of this information than necessarily those people who are um, almost siloed in the security team. So as far as how to approach that, uh, it's it's a tough challenge. But I think that the more what I found and in, in work with a lot of clients has been the most effective thing I can do is have conversations with individual people, individual developers about security and just answer their questions and, and get them a little bit interested in one little area of security where from there, because developers are a curious group, InfoSec people are a curious group. If you teach and you get them excited about one little thing, from there, that that spark ignites something more and they start to grow on their own and start to learn on their own. And I think that's one of the most effective things that you can do in an organization, not siloing security in the security team, but teaching a little bit at a time to different people and getting them interested. And from there, there's developers are smart people. Operations people are smart people. And if they have that interest, they will find the way to learn what they need to learn. And way more than you can just teach them sitting down, you know, spewing information about InfoSec. So if you just give them the basic information, I think that is a really good way to start because um, they'll they'll lead themselves down the path to learn more. Uh, that To me, that's the, that's the way I've found is the best way to cross over. I, I kind of want to argue a different point of view on that just a little bit. I agree that developers are really smart people, but I also think that developers are overloaded with all of the things that they already need to know like mm -hmm. how databases work and how to index things and how networks work. Adding security is yet another thing that makes it hard to be successful as a good engineer. How are, are, have you thought about ways to make security easier for developers? Are there, are there things that you've thought of that we can do as, as a community, as a security community, as a developer community to make writing more secure software easier other than, you know, the obvious things like, you know, garbage collection and and uh, safe memory access. Uh, what are the things that we can do as a group to make applications more secure? I keep looking at these news articles about uh, all these compromised machines across the globe and and thinking that that's a failure on our part as developers in whole or as as companies as businesses even to um, to secure software. I think that that's also a, a management problem too, though, right? Because it's not part of the life cycle, and I think that. Engineering and security are two different hats. Even if you possess both skills, it's very hard to look at the problem in both ways, right? I think there's time developing features, and then I think there's time like kind of really going over your code in a meticulous way, looking for potential attack vectors. So before Aaron answers, I want to throw up, uh, one perspective. I've been sitting here and thinking about security and thinking, Oh my God, if I had to learn every like enough about security to make an application thoroughly secured, it is too much. Like Brian was saying, we have to know so many different things. And the context switching, like Eric say, you have to look at things from a totally different perspective to think about security. And I was sitting here thinking, well, I'm I am truly glad the place where I work now, they have a security team, like many companies do, and there is a, an audit process. So at some point in the software development, once it gets close to being ready for production, it goes through this audit. And for me, it's like, yeah, great. Find out all the problems my software has, tell me, and I'll fix it. But having to know a lot more uh, about security than I do, it's, it's burdensome, I think. I think there's, um, there's, you know, so security is a really, really broad world. And I'll, I'll let Aaron speak to this as far as like kind of like 
red teams and how involved that is, how many people there are with specialized skills when they do that. But I think when we talk about uh, engineers, I think we're talking about a surface level of security. Like the better majority of things um, that happen are usually the trivial things. It's it's SQL injection. It's it's unsanitized inputs, especially for PHP. It's it's local and remote file inclusion vulnerabilities, and these are like really easy things to catch. And I think that most of us are aware of what they are, right? Like if you were asked a question in in an interview, like what is SQL injection? Yeah, most engineers could could describe what that is, but I think having the time and actually um, exploiting uh, a cross-site scripting vulnerability or a SQL injection vulnerability starts to make you aware of how it's used. And I think it makes it easier to catch. I think that the the point that you bring up about having the basics covered is, is really important. Um, it is intimidating to think about all of the things you need to think about to be an expert in security, to know what different kind of vulnerabilities there are out there. And, and I'm going to let you in on a little secret is no matter how much you catch, there's always going to be some something there. Um, I don't think there it's possible to have code that is completely secure unless it's maybe one line developed in isolation and has no callouts and no inputs. Uh, it's it's almost impossible. So you can't. I don't think you can necessarily lose sleep over that. Um, you have to look at it from the basics perspective, and then from there, I think what a good security person will do is um, is understand. Because the, the way to make something mo the most secure is to make it not functional at all. Um, so you have to have a trade-off. So a, a good security person will look at something and, and understand the business risks and understand really what it's trying to do and find the best way to put the most security measures in place. But some of the basics, I mean, I can go over some of the basics you should probably know. Um, as a reference to to cover the basics, I think three main things stand out that I think a lot of uh, that you can e that you can easily do and keep in mind when you're developing something and then um, you're covering a substantial amount of vulnerabilities. Um, the first one is is the patch. So just make sure your libraries are up to date as much as possible, especially if there's a security vulnerability. Um, so just be aware that the latest one is probably going to be the best for that. It's not always possible to keep things up to date. I understand that in an environment it's um, where you know you have so many dependencies. Sometimes upgrading is not an option. Uh, from there, you can. There's other mitigations you can put in place. Put something in front of it, or check for um, knowing. Try to learn what the exact vulnerabilities are and find other ways of mitigating it. Uh, so patching and keeping things up to date is probably one of the most important things um, and one of the easiest wins you can have. And that applies to operating systems as well and applications and, and libraries. Um, the second thing is is probably the most important thing is input validation. Uh, is understanding that the input that you're getting from a user is what you think it is and checking that on the server rather than on the client because uh, client side controls can be bypassed very easily because um, it's just in the browser. If you use something like a, a proxy like Burp or Zap, um, you can intercept the request, change, change the data after it's left the browser and then send it on and it completely bypasses any kind of client side um, input validation. So checking that the, the information that you're getting is what you think it is um, and not some kind of malformed input like you know a super long string to get a buffer overflow or negative numbers when you don't expect negative numbers uh, or special characters that you don't expect. Uh, the best way to do that is to use a whitelist over a blacklist. So the difference between a whitelist and a blacklist means a whitelist is looking for a set number of things that are allowed, um, whereas a blacklist is looking for a set number of things that are not allowed. Um, the number of things, the number of uh, inputs that can be allowed through is significantly less when you use a whitelist. And so you are much more aware and you have much more control about the data that comes through as opposed to a, with a blacklist. You, there, there may be a ton of things that you haven't even thought of that could come through that can get um, around your, your validation. So input validation is probably the most important because um, really any vulnerability, any exploit comes from user input. So if you can control that, if you can find some way of mitigating that, you would have saved, you, you could probably reduce at least 50% of the vulnerabilities that you may have in place, which is huge. Um, the third one is, is output encoding. And this is more of a preventative measure. So when you're outputting data onto a web application, for example, if you encode it with HTML encoding, for example, um, by doing that, you will then reduce the likelihood of something like cross-site scripting, which is essentially when an uh, attacker can get JavaScript uh, to run in a client browser through input they provided. So if you can encode those characters, then it won't look like JavaScript and it won't execute as JavaScript. It'll just look like a string of, of gibberish almost. So doing 
patching, input validation, open encoding are three of the biggest things. Um, there's a few other things that I can just brief, briefly mention if, in case you're taking notes and you want some more depth. Um, but one is hard-coded credentials and API keys. So just, there, I think there was probably, I don't know, maybe four months ago, um, it, it showed up on Hacker News that you could just do a search for password in uh, in Git pushes. And you, you search that and you found thousands and thousands of Git commits that had a password in it or had you know someone mentioning a password or taking a password out of their application. Um, so having those hard-coded credentials, especially in open source software, is trivial to find. And then someone just someone could take that easily. They don't have to have any skills and just access your, your machine. Um, so making sure you have a safe way of passing up uh, uh, strings and, and secure information and secrets to an application is important. Um, and then you know two other key things is authentication and authorization. So making sure that people can um, are doing the things that they should be doing, and they're uh, allowed to do that, and they're, they're they're gated from doing things they shouldn't be doing. And then the last uh, last key point is encrypting data at rest and in transit. Um, so making sure that you have uh, you're using a you know TLS over the web. Uh, you're you're implementing a security uh, certificate. Uh, Let's Encrypt makes it super easy to do that now. Um, and then encrypting it at rest. So using something using proven crypto like uh, AES or Bcrypt for hashing are just some examples. I know that was a lot to take in, um, and I'm sure that a lot of people are probably going to go back and, and review over that. Uh, but if you can just cover those things, just keep those in mind as you're developing, you will, I guarantee you, you'll reduce at least 90% of the vulnerabilities that can be introduced in your application just from those things alone. Well, how about my favorite one, which is don't roll your own crypto? <laughs> <laughs> Number one rule of crypto, don't roll your own crypto. Yeah. Uh, Please. I was going to say it. This, uh, what you just said, that list will make a great blog post. Absolutely. And, and I might do that. <laughs> yeah. If you do it, uh, make sure to share it with us. We'll share it with everybody. Definitely. Now, th these are kind of generic from any programming language. How about, since you've had some time in Go, how about Go? What are, what are some attack vectors that exist in, in Go? Or what, what are some areas where Go saves you from yourself? So Go is pretty good at saving yourself, uh, saving you from yourself, especially on the web side. Um, just the the number one thing that I've seen that that makes thing makes it a lot easier to defend against attacks. Um, and I had my students go through using this as well. Is HTML templating in the standard library? Uh, it provides automatic output encoding um, on your HTML pages. I'm not sure how many. I'm sh you know I'm pretty sure that most uh, of the web frameworks out there now are using templating. Um, it would be kind of a waste of time not to, but the default HTML templating um, does output encoding for you, which saves you a lot. And output encoding isn't just for client side output. It's also applied to when you're passing data into a database, into like a, a, SQL, a SQL database in the back backend. Um, so one other thing that Go does for you, if you're using uh, a lot of the, the SQL packages that you can use have uh, the concept, actually they all should have this, but have parameterized queries. So what that means is, when you're passing data into your um, database uh, connections, when you're sending a, a SQL query, you're not just simply passing uh, data that a user provides and adding it directly into the SQL query. So, um, you know, concatenating into a string. That by doing that, you're essentially allowing a, an attacker to make whatever SQL query they want to make on your database. And if you return that data into the application in some way, then they can see sensitive data, or they can even just drop all the tables. Um, there's a classic XKCD comic. I think it's called uh, John, Bobby Tables. If you look that yeah. up, you'll see a, a funny example of, uh, of, of SQL injection. Um, you know, so that's really good for that. One of my favorite things learned in SQL injection was for years I understood SQL injection and getting content back on the page or inserting data, um, logging in using SQL injection. But the one that really blew my mind when we talk about kind of like the creativity of a hacker is blind SQL injection. <laughs> like the fact that, you know, and, and I'll let you um, describe how this works, but it's just amazing that people can just use things like sleeps and, and enumerate data. Yeah, so blind SQL injection is like a whole other level of, of SQL injection attacks. Uh, and it's more common nowadays because there's better SQL protections in place um, by default in most in most languages. So blind SQL injection, like you referred to, is using ways. Um, so when you don't have immediate feedback as to what the results of your SQL uh, injection was, 
you have to find other other uh, channels to determine what happened. So a perfect example is people use timing attacks. So if you make a SQL injection attack, or sorry, if you make a SQL um, request or you pass in data that results in a SQL injection, it will return back in a certain amount of time fairly consistently on a normal request. But if you were to inject a sleep command and then suddenly the application uh, takes 10 seconds or however long you specify, longer to actually return back to you, then you know that you've gotten SQL injection. And then from there, it's a matter of mapping it out. Um, there's a really useful tool. I don't even think, I don't know how many people actually do manual SQL injection anymore because it's it's so complex and there's so many um, good defenses in place now. But there's a tool called SQL Map that does this automatically for you. Uh, it's got a lot of really good options, but it, it essentially will enumerate um, what kind of injection vectors there are and tell you uh, how vulnerable it was, what kind of uh, strings will result in an uh, injection attack, things like that. It automates a lot of it for you. And most of the people that I know that do SQL injection um, will either start with something more, they'll usually start with something more manual, uh, like doing the sleep command, for example. And then once they find that there's something there, then they'll throw SQL map at it and, uh, and, and get some more detailed output because there's just so much to know when it comes to SQL injection. I'm sure there's a ton of experts out there, or a few experts out there, but it's it's a lot. There's also a um, a newer tool called NoSQL Map that uh, uh, is for like MongoDB and things like that too. Oh, nice. To kind of go more in depth about the blind SQL attack, like an example of that would be um, most of the time when you see like a SQL injection, you'll see where people try to log in, where a username and they'll put the parentheses and stuff. But basically you could do where username e uh, like a percent sign and then you could do a sleep. And then basically you'd go through and you're like, oh, C slept for five seconds. I know it starts with C. Let me move to the next character. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, it's the fact that somebody had that creativity blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's really crazy. One, one book I'd recommend for anyone that's interested in, in web application security, I would say this is probably the standard book you, you can reference. Um, you, don't, you don't even need to read it from cover to cover. Just using it as a reference is important. Um, it's called the Web Application Hacker's Handbook. It's really good, and it covers a lot of these topics in depth that you need to know for web-specific security. So if I can make a recommendation, I'd, I'd make that one. I don't think I have that one. It's really good. I think it's at the second edition now. Yeah, most of those books are in like their second, third, fourth edition. It's like the same problems keep repeating themselves. Yeah, it just it, it evolves so much and so quickly over time. And I mean, that's one of the things I love about it is you're, it's a constant game of of learning and and you know cat and mouse. But it's uh, because of that, it's hard to have a standard um, paper book as a medium nowadays because it's so fast. Before we kind of close out on this, like there's a couple of things that I'm interested in. So. Do you think that like the nomenclature between the sides helps create that kind of polarization, you know, red team versus blue team, you know, um, it kind of creates that tension be between the sides. Do you think there's a way that we can change that? Because it, it really does feel like a game, right? Like you versus them. And mm -hmm. it, that's it's not really how I think we're going to evolve. I think that becoming team members um, is more important. That's a really good point. And that's, that's actually, um, it's funny you bring that up. That's the thing that I'm researching most right now is um, there's a term that covers this, this movement towards integration of developers, operations, and security. Um, and it's, it sounds very buzzwordy, but um, it's the I have dumbest yet to term ever. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's so, I, I don't necessarily agree with the term. I don't like saying it. I feel what I did. Anyways, it's, uh, it's called DevSecOps, but the way I look at it is just, it's an integration between those three um, groups. And the idea is to have developers, operations, and security um, work together in a lot more ways. Uh, and and from, from what I've learned and what I'm, I'm, when I'm working with clients with this is the number one ways to do that, or the, the top two ways to do that is through automation uh, and through uh, education as well. Um, and there's, there's more to it, but basically it's by automating things you can make it easier for developers to not have to worry about security as much or to fix things easy, more easily. Um, and that's kind of where the, the DevOps movement comes in, um, is, is automating a lot of the common tasks that you're going to be doing. There's no way that you can automate everything. Um, I, I really don't believe that in the next, at least in the next uh, five to 10 years, 
everything will be automated away in security because things are changing so much and there's so much room for creativity. Um, but there are certain common things that you can automate. Um, even just doing regular expressions, looking for common mistakes or looking for SQL strings that have a, a plus character in it for concatenation. Simple things like that make it easier to move quickly um, and to not have to worry about security as much. And then where the education standpoint comes in is um, there's a few approaches to this. One is like security champions. So to have a group, um, uh, an individual on each team represents security. Uh, there's also a center of excellence where you have a, one security group where they um, then disseminate information through the organization. Uh, Adobe has a belt program. Um, there's all different ways that people go about doing it. But the, the idea is essentially that you are sharing information about security um, actively with your developers and operations teams so that they are able to at least um, understand it a little bit more. Um, not necessarily as thoroughly as like a security expert will, but at least they have the basic understanding. And that's where, you know, things like the OWASP top 10 comes in handy, which is the top 10 uh, most common security vulnerabilities in the web. Um, things like, I think there's the, it's a little older, but there's uh, uh, the, what is it? The SANS and CWE top 25 most dangerous software errors. Um, there's a, a few things like lists like that that help, but the way that essentially coming back to DevSecOps, again, the buzzword term, is the idea of, of joining all three together. And doing it is very unique to an organization, but essentially they, they it really revolves around automation and um, education. So there's one thing that I want to add uh, in terms of automated help. Uh, HP Labs uh, released an app called Gas that's included in Go Metalinter. And it's truly my favorite in terms of automation. Uh, Gas lets you uh, check your code in an automated fashion against uh, several types of vulnerabilities and known insecure things. And you can tweak which tests it runs. And I highly recommend if you're going to have a, an application in production that you run Gas in your, um, in your CI, in your tests suite before you put it to production, because I found that uh, it's got some pretty decent defaults in terms of security. And it catches things like, um, you know, using string concatenation in your SQL queries and, and things like that. So I like gas a lot. That came from uh, HP Labs originally, but I think they put it under its own domain. It's on GitHub now at goastscanner slash gas. We need a link for that, Brian, please. Okay. And Aaron, so, if I'm an engineer and we already have so much to keep up with, but if I do want to learn at least to make sure that I'm doing the basics and I want to do a little bit of time, like I don't want to take up and go do a project, um, what recommendations would you have? Um, so I, I think one of the obvious answers to me right now is um, there's, a, there's actually a, a product that Security Compass made just to solve that problem. Um, I don't think there's I don't know if there's anything else out there right now like that, but what it is, is it's called SD Elements. Um, it's, uh, think about it as a, a software, a software security requirements checker. So you give it a list of what you're doing. So it's a web application written in, I don't know, written in this language in, let's say Java. Um, and it uh, has these kind of users. You give it those requirements and it basically gives you a checklist of things that you need to know as a developer to write things securely. Um, there's also uh, things like the OWASP Top 10 is probably another really good resource because it's giving you just 10 things that you should keep in mind when you're writing web applications. Um, there's there's more to the OWASP. There's more than just the OWASP Top 10, but it's a really good start. Um, and if you have those fundamentals, then it will seriously do a, a um, it'll cause a huge improvement in your security. Um, so I would recommend those two things just to start. Well. So I think um, a lot of that stuff is almost from a blue team perspective. And I think what Carlicia might have been hinting at, if, if you want to kind of um, be more aware of the red team angle and may maybe educate yourself to attack these vectors, kind of if I had minimal time to invest in that training, um, is there kind of like any recommendations for um, places to start? I also wanted to point out that there is a Go-specific OWASP book at github slash check marks with an x check marks slash go dash scp and i have not read this yet but i have heard of several people who have and find it to be a pretty decent guide as to following owasp standards from a go app so uh, if you do read it let us know what you think about it nice yeah i, I read through the first part of that it's actually pretty well done um, they okay. do cover a lot of good good specific go owasp um, 
basically security issues that you need to be aware of. And there's a new book that's um, being worked on called Black Hat Go. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I saw that. I bought it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't want to miss it. Yeah, I've already pre-ordered mine. Yeah, I just don't, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget about it. I didn't know that they were were selling it. Um, I've reviewed a couple of chapters for them, um, but I I didn't realize it was for sale. They it's in pre-order. They don't have anything to give yet. I'm also doing a technical review of that as well. Nice. Awesome. So the question, the question that Carlicia had was, um, if, if I, if I'm getting it right, was, um, what's something you can do fairly quickly to understand, uh, security a little bit better so you can become, so you can develop a lot more securely. Is that, is that correct? Let's, let's kind of yeah, frame it as you're engineer and you're trying to become more red team, but you don't have a lot of time to invest in that. Like, uh, so book recommendations or something. All right, I'm okay. going to be annoying. Wait, I'm going to be annoying. Go ahead. Let's define uh, red hats in red black team. hats and blue hats or team. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, I, th I think we, we, we said we would come to what those were, right. but I don't think we ever defined them. <laughs> all right, so, so red teams. Yeah, no, we, we're using, this is a problem in, in InfoSec because we use terms all the time that we understand. And then, you know, we use them in everyday conversations all the time. And then we throw out terms like red team, blue team, even purple team, and assuming that people know what it means. And it's the same in any <laughs> deeply technical field. And it happens all the time. Um, so red team, the, the idea of red team when you're talking about, um, so there's, there's two different ways that red team is used. One is the term of the offensive side of security is red team. Blue team would be the defensive side of security. It comes from military term where they would do um, simulations or they would do uh, you know practice attacks, and the red team would be the attackers and the blue team would be the defenders. Uh, there's also a practice called red teaming where, um, and this is I think what what Eric referred to earlier was uh, the idea of red teaming is doing a full uh, simulated attack uh, on you know on a, an organization on an environment with a particular goal of, for example, getting um, to database admin or getting HR records. Um, and the idea is you are essentially emulating an attacker with no holds barred um, and, and doing everything that an attacker would. Um, and I've done a number of these assessments myself and what it essentially involves is you, uh, let's say you have a, an organization that you're choosing to, to attack and you use means that are technical, um, social engineering as well comes into place. So you're tricking people into doing things for you or giving you information. Um, there's also a physical side of things. You will physically break into buildings or, um, you know, pick locks, things like that. And, and all of it really is, is around emulating uh, a real attacker, someone who wouldn't be held back by, um, you know, needing to come in between nine to five. Right. So that's, that's another way that people use red teaming is, is in that specific type of attack. And I think to feel better about like the, the breadth of um, security knowledge, um, those red teams are usually composed of multiple people. There's a web guy, there's a Wi-Fi guy, there's, you know, there's uh, kind of all, uh, usually a reverse engineer, depending on kind of what's being attacked. So no one person kind of encompasses all of that knowledge. There's just too many attack vectors to be familiar with. So what is the difference between head, uh, red hat and a red team or blue hats and blue team, black hat, blue, black team? I don't know if there's a black team. What, what you're probably thinking of is, is white hat, black hat. Um, and so what that gray terminology hat. means, it, <laughs> gray hat, yes. If, if we want to talk about gray hat, <laughs> if that's even a thing. Um, but the difference is uh, it's the idea of, uh, it takes the term from those old cowboy movies where usually the good guy would be wearing a white cowboy hat and the bad guy would be wearing a black cowboy hat. Um, so usually when you're looking at a, at a, a hacker uh, or a malicious attacker would be a black hat. Whereas someone who's doing security on the um, for the good guys protecting an organization is usually a white hat. There's the term gray hat, which um, people can argue is a thing, but I think it's just, you know, it, the idea is to do things that may be, it's almost like uh, chaotic neutral. So doing things that could be uh, illegal or could be attacks, but you're doing it for good reasons. Um, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's that middle zone where you're not really sure whether they're the good guy or the bad guy. I, I guess a good example of that would be um, you, you possess uh, hacking skills and you're constantly looking in for vulnerabilities in sites that you don't have permission to do so, but you're reporting to them. So 
you're you're hacking in the sense that that's not legal. You don't have permission to do that, but you kind of are trying to do it for your own righteous cause. Um, I don't know whether hacktivism falls into gray hat, so I think that's too that's too far on the black side. Yeah, I mean, so what you're referring to is now, so I think it's evolved over time. That, that's, I think that was what it was originally, how people referred to it. Um, now there's, uh, most people that do that call themselves security, freelance security researchers, or what's more common is they're involved in bug bounty programs. Um, so it's transitioned to a model where bug bounty programs are essentially, um, is a way for an organization to open up their, an application and set specific guidelines around um, uh the ways that can be attacked, but they open it up for attack to anyone. And if they, uh, as long as they follow the rules of like, this thing can't be touched, um, as long as you're not doing denial of service attacks, um, everything's open. If you, uh, if you open, if an organization opens up their application or um, their system for doing that, then anytime someone submits uh, a bug to them, a security vulnerability, they will be then rewarded with something like with swag or with, with real money. Um, there's a few big players in that space. Um, there's Hacker One. Which uh, side note, HackerOne actually has a couple of really good resources if you want to learn more about security and bug bounties. Uh, it's a really good way to keep up. Um, they have something called the Zero Daily Newsletter, uh, which is, a, as it sounds, a, a daily newsletter for security, with showing just some of the latest bug bounty reports. Um, then there's also uh, HackerOne and uh, Cobalt.io is another one, I think. So those are kind of the main players in the bug bounty space. But it's it's a way that people practice it in a legal way. Um, but people still do it uh, in in that gray area where they're they're finding problems and they're submitting issues. The problem is like an organization technically could uh, issue legal action and it has happened many times. And so that's where um, it, it becomes problematic. And um, there's a whole other debate around whether that should happen or not. But um, I think that's kind of what you're referring to, Eric, is, is people doing research and, and finding these things and submitting them. Um, and that still does happen. So were there any uh, questions before we move on to our uh, projects and news? I think it's time. Carlisa, any follow-up questions? No, just uh, if Aaron could drop a link eventually for that tool he mentions, the developers can run and check, like do a check off of all the things they're doing and get a recommendation. Sure. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. No problem. And if anyone, like I, I should note that if anyone has any questions, there's so much that can be covered and I could probably be on here for another three hours and talk about security to help <laughs> to help discuss like what the issues are. Um, but I'm open if anyone wants to reach out to me at any point in time. I'm sure we'll post my Twitter and stuff in, in um, the show notes, but I'm I'm always open to talk and I, I want to I wanna help people with this. And, and there's a lot to know. And I feel like sharing what I know is is um, a way to help improve that. So don't don't be shy to reach out. And are you going to be a gopher con? I oh, I so badly wanted to, but I'm going to be. A, I have to be at a wedding that day that my wife's actually involved in the wedding, so I couldn't get out of that one. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty poor excuse. I tried. <laughs> I'm not buying that. Just because your wife has to be in the wedding doesn't mean you need to miss the greatest conference on earth. I know, I know. The only people we forgive for missing the conference is people who are actually getting married that day or, or giving or birth. any day of that's that week. Yeah. Point. Giving birth as well. So is That's your true. wife in the bridal party? Yeah, she is. See, see, so if they have the bridal party table, you're not going to see her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll use that, uh, use that on her. <laughs> you're going to be taking pictures and, <laughs> But you honey, know. you won't even know I'm not there. <laughs> That's right. This is like the Olympics for Go. How can you let me miss this for just sitting at some table with all of the other spouses? <laughs> if it's uh excuse i mean i mean support you need there's more where that came from so just get in touch with herrick or brian yeah just let us know we're good at this we've we've got years of experience be definitely, like honey definitely. it's 2017 there's FaceTime. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we gave him a really nice gift from the registry oh <laughs> uh, all right, we better so, move on to news before we get ourselves all divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to make a comment, but never mind. It, it's too late, right? <laughs> now I'm interested. <laughs> what was that comment going to be? <laughs> sort of like that. It's too late for a couple of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, go news. 
<laughs> right. So I Go saw news. an interesting article. Um, I think it was earlier this week called Fencing Off Go. And it was based off of like a, a white paper. Um, that's really interesting. I won't go into too much detail there. I'll put it in the show notes, but, um, it's, it's a lot of cool stuff in trying to find, uh, deadlocks and race conditions in your Go programs. I'll drop that in the Slack channel now for anybody who's following along live. Anybody else have anything cool they found this week? Yes. So, well, first of all, Go 1.9 beta 2 was released and that's big. Very, That's, very big. So speaking of one nine, what do we have coming in that? Uh, aliases, the type aliases. aliases. Uh, parallel compilation, that was something that's Parallel really cool. compilation, that's a big one. So in one um, nine, I'm interested to see, has anybody done any comparisons on compile time now that the, compile, the parallel compilation is in there? No, I'm actually uh, uh, cloning a fresh copy of Kubernetes this afternoon so I can do a test with 1.8 and 1.9 just to see you know, Kubernetes is about the biggest Go app I can think of to to download and and compile with each version. Isn't there support for uh, ARM sixty four bit as well on this one? Uh, I think it was PPC sixty four. Hmm. Oh, I think it's ARM seven. There was we've always had ARM. Well, not always, but we've recently already had ARM sixty four. I think it's ARM seven that is new. But you know, I could be wrong. I'll have to Google it again later. <laughs> we'll have to go look at the release notes. Yeah, we'll link to the the one nine release notes in in the show notes. But I'm I'm trying to think of um, anything else that was really big there. I think uh, concur- they implemented a concurrent map in the standard library. Yeah. Um, concurrent maps and oh, you know what the the big thing that this enables though is Go one point eight on App Engine. So finally, Go one point eight is in beta on App Engine. If anybody's got uh, Go apps that have been frustrated by being stuck at Go 1.6.2 forever. Uh, Now Go 1.8 is in App Engine because we have type aliases. So that's a big deal. All right, what else do we have? I found a package uh, that I liked. uh, I haven't used it, but it looked interesting called uh, Go Ref. And it's at github.com slash M-R-E-I-T hub slash Go R-E-F, Go Ref. And it reminds me of uh, the package that I kind of did a proof of concept on, which was my uh, trace package in that this is an invocation tracker. It tracks the execution times of your functions. It finds bottlenecks in your code, making sure all your Go routines exit properly. And it tracks all the calls to your HTTP endpoints. So it was implemented very similarly to the way I did. Uh, the only difference in this one versus mine is that uh, I I built mine with context support so i wanted to go dig into this and see what kind of things i could learn to improve mine because it looks pretty good i'll drop the link to that in the slack i think um other than that we lots of conference stuff going on right now um uh gopher cons in two weeks if you're slacking buy your ticket um gotham go i think just started uh doing ticket sales uh one of the other gopher cons just started doing ticket sales too Go has announced speakers, and Brian Yay. is one of them. And same for Golang UK. Yes. Golang UK is announcing speakers, and I'm one of those too. It's uh, it's that time of year, conference season. Yeah, ready for go for con Brazil. The CFP Ooh. is not open yet, but it's going to happen in November. Ooh. They're selling tickets. Oh, can you guys hear that lightning? We better <laughs> we better wrap this show up before we lose electricity again. <laughs> Uh, so are we ready for free software Friday? Well, I, I want to mention a couple of things. Uh, one go for con or bust hashtag on Twitter has been oh, very yes. sad it last has. year, the years before there is, was awesome. I mean, two weeks uh, to go for the conference. It was buzzing. It's very sad now. So people start well, using I, it. I think, um, last year it was because so many people started commuting there. You know, they were driving from Canada and, and Brian drove up from Florida. So Oh, that yeah. is true. There there was that big big uh CoreOS bus. Yes. So yes. You're not for, doing that? CoreOS uh, bus was, was two years ago. Yeah. So for your commute to GopherCon, all your travels and preparations for GopherCon, uh, uh hashtag GopherCon or bust is kind of fun. 
and mine will start uh, a week from Monday. That's when I travel really? out there. Is it that soon? It is that soon. OMG. So by the time this airs, by the time this is released, it will be like only a couple days till we hop on a plane. Wow, that l- thunder is really going, huh? Yeah, we're we're in <laughs> trouble. So I I promised that I would announce my big news today, but I have to kind of couch that a little bit. Um, I have have accepted an offer at a exciting company, but they've asked me not to announce it until roughly next week because they're getting a full page ad for the New York Times together, and Washington Post and um, CNN. So. Uh, I won't announce where I'm going, but I do have a very exciting new job. I could not be happier about joining the team, and I can't tell you where it is yet. And that full-page ad thing was a joke. Sorry. <laughs> I, I heard no laughing. <laughs> but, yeah, that was a joke. So you get to hang another another week to find out where I'm going. Everybody's Amazon Whole Foods. Yeah. Put, put in your votes, and we need a Twitter poll. <laughs> All right, so free software Friday. So for anybody who's new to the show, every Friday, or well, we release these on Thursdays, but it started as a free software Friday, so we're keeping it that way. Um, we just try to give a shout out to a project or maintainer, uh, not necessarily go specific, but just to show the love. Um, they don't always get the uh, the good feedback, so let's let's praise everybody. Uh, and there used to be a hashtag free software Friday on Twitter. I don't know whether people are still using it, but definitely do that too. I see some, but I haven't been uh, leading the way either. So, cause we do it on the show. It's kind of overkill. All right. So, who? so I'll start if, if you want, I've got a, um, a package that I found over the last two weeks that I absolutely love. Uh, I, I think it's been pretty obvious that I've moved over to Windows. I've given up my Mac completely. I don't have any Macs left. I do have a single Linux machine left in my house, but it's not turned on anymore. So I'm pretty much 100% Windows at this point. And I've been using uh, Windows subsystem for Linux and the command prompt in Windows is getting significantly better, but it's still nothing like a really good Linux terminal prompt. So um, I found an app called WSLTTY. And it's basically a bridge between MinTTY, which is the nicest Windows command terminal thing, and WSL. So it allows you to have uh, what I would expect to be a decent Linux terminal prompt, but in Windows and pointed at the Windows subsystem for Linux. It has made me significantly happier working on the command line. So thank you to the WSLTTY team. That's at, uh, where is it at? Uh, GitHub.com slash MinTTY slash WSLTTY. All right, I'll go next. I found this actually on the Go newsletter, and it's called GoMan. It's a tool to to produce um, man pages based on the readme that you have on your repo. And especially for open source projects, it's I think it's really cool. And if you go to their repo readme page, they list other tools that are related. There is one called Go Mango. Gosh, I have to go there and see. But it will let you produce a main page based on comments that you put on your Go code itself. I haven't used it, but it looks really neat, and I do want to use it. That's really cool. Yeah. 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 Now, if, now if I could just get a tool to generate um, Bash and ZSH completions for me automatically, I suppose you could do that if you use something like um, is it Ruby? Cobra. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot, so there's a lot of um, Go command line <laughs> app tools, so you so could you my, could do some static analysis. That was my dynamic language troll of the week. I'll I'll step away from the microphone now. <laughs> Uh, how about you, Aaron? Did you have anybody you want to give a shout out to this week? Yeah, uh, it's, I, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Visual Studio Code um, and, and specifically the Go plugin because that is like, I use it for everything related to Go. Everything I write, everything I review, all done in there and it's really easy. Um, I know I know you guys are heavy BIM users and I've yet to make the, the jump, the leap over to it full time, but uh, for now it's Visual Studio Code. Code is awesome. Did you hear mm-hmm. that? Uh, did we release our episode with Ramya? We did, right? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't used VS Code, but I think people should use whatever whatever they're comfortable in, whatever they're productive in. I mean, you don't have to kind of follow suit. And you know, if if I hadn't been uh, a Vim user for I don't even know now, it'd probably make me feel old thinking about it. Um, then you know, I think VS Code looks really good. You know, I have absolutely no problem jumping editors constantly. I use Visual Studio Code, I use Gogland, and I use Vim. The only thing that I do is uh, I consistently use the Vim plugins for the editor and the the IDE when I'm in Gogland and Visual Studio Code. But they're both great editors. Visual Studio Code is just fast and it's light and it's easy to open. Gogland has all kinds of awesome, powerful features and, you know, Vim is Vim. So I have, I have no problem jumping between them and I don't feel the need to apologize. Yeah. My policy is every two years, I check out a new editor. And a big thing with me is that I have no problem being the user of a couple editors simultaneously. So I'll use mm -hmm. one for both things, but I was another one for things that they that particular editor is really good at. So there is no problem with that either. You don't have it's not a religion. <laughs> I might make that yeah. my mission after GopherCon is to you know do like a two week or a month stint with VS Code. You should. I highly recommend it, especially you know if you use the Vim plugin, which is really good for both Gogland and VS Code. You know you won't. You won't be sad about your muscle memory, but you'll get some really pretty tools. The code lenses in Visual Studio Code are gorgeous. Love those. The debugging is pretty useful as well. It's got del del built in. Yeah, uh, debugging's for wimps. <laughs> <laughs> format print, print, print lines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, just print line. I, I said format that print line, but if you use just print line in your debugging, then you don't have to remove an uh, import when you when you're uh, done debugging. So. Don't use format.println, just use print line with a lowercase p. It's a built in. Good to know. <laughs> it's your tip of the <laughs> Stop trolling, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trolling a little bit much. So, my free software Friday for this week um, is actually something that Target uh, put out, and it's what? called Kate Guard. And it's really interesting, and uh, for anybody who listens to the show, it's uh, programming, Kubernetes, and InfoSec for me. So this is a Kubernetes thing, um, and it's basically something you install in your cluster, and it works really great for clusters that have a lot of stuff, especially like kind of multi-tenancy, where there's multiple teams deploying multiple apps. And it kind of uh, monitors the cluster for things that are running that uh, have specific violations, you know. Um, the size of the image, whether they're setting uh, UID or GUID, um, uh, whether the containers are running privileged, whether they're mounting host volumes, um, whether there's only single replicas, uh, just kind of like a variety of um, filters on uh, looking at things that are running in the cluster and kind of producing notifications about those. So wow. it might work really well for an operations team that's supporting multiple development teams, uh, pods and stuff. And I will drop a link to that in the channel, and it will also be in the show notes. Drop the mic. All right. Any other shout outs before we close this thing out? All right. I will take that as a no. So a uh, big thank you to everybody for being on the show, especially Aaron. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So this, is, this has been really great. And uh, as Aaron said, you know, he's, he's available for anybody who has questions and wants to learn more about uh, security and, and writing better code will drop all of his contact details uh home address phone number his home address and social, <laughs> social security number, number. yeah <laughs> yeah we we get all of that before we put people on the show <laughs> it keeps them in line i forgot to send you the cvv code i'll get you after thank you <laughs> So a huge thank you to um, all of the listeners right now. Um, you can find us at, um, at GoTimeFM on Twitter, GoTime.FM online. And if you want to be on the show, have suggestions for guests or questions, uh, hit us up on GitHub.com slash GoTimeFM slash ping. And uh, with that, we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. This was fun. Bye, everyone. All right, that's it for this episode of Go Time. Tune in live on Thursdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelog.com slash live. Join the community in Slack with us. In real time during the shows, head to changelog.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. 
Special thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. Also, Linode, we host everything we do on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash changelog. GoTime is edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for GoTime is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.